So good morning to those of you out there. This your girl Tiffany coming through here live in the back. And I want to say happy so-called Thanksgiving for those of you that are celebrating the holiday. Uh, you call it the indigenous holiday, whatever you guys want to celebrate. I like to call it the commemoration day to commemorate those who had lost their lives during this tragic time. So I don't see it as being something very, very positive, but more so commemoration day to those natives who lost their lives to the European who wanted to get, who was over here getting this land and trying to take over the resources and all of that extra stuff. So they lost their lives. They, you know, with smallpox disease and all of that stuff. So, um, but anyways, I hope you guys enjoying this morning on this particular day. So today it was something unique. And good, mor good morning, brother Umi. Good morning, brother Umi. So today it was something very unique. And I decided that I'm going to do black history on this uh, Thanksgiving day. So I want to look at two subject matters, okay? So I'm going to look at some information about... Richard R. Wright Jr. So yesterday I did some information about his father, right? Or no, Tuesday I did the information about his father. Uh, Richard R. Wright Sr., who was the founding president of what is known today as Savannah State University. And I went into the origin and history, gave some reading materials on that. So today I'm here to present some more reading materials about Richard R. Wright Jr., and I got some reading materials on Guadalupe College or Guadalupe College, which was located in Seguin, Texas. All right. So let's go ahead and get started on this early morning. On my time, I don't know about everybody else's. OK, but my time is different. All right. So as you can see, that's a picture of Richard R. Wright. Jr. Blow him up. That's a picture of Richard R. Wright Jr. All right, but let's go into his biography. So he was born in April, born on April 16th, 1878 in Cuthbert, Georgia, and he died on December the 12th of 1967. He was an American sociologist, social worker, and minister. In 1911, Wright became the first African-American to earn a doctorate in sociology from an organized graduate school when he received his Ph.D. from the University of Pennsylvania. Now, he was the editor from 1909 to 1936 for the Christian Recorder. Then based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, it is known as the oldest existing periodical published by African-Americans in the United States who existed dated before the Civil War. All right, so he attended Georgia State College, which was the first public historically black college in the state. OK. And today. Georgia State College is now Savannah University. So Savannah University started off as a school for African-American youth. Okay, it started off as a secondary school. Then it went through so many name changes. It became Georgia State College. Then it became Savannah College. Then it became Savannah State University. But let's continue. All right, so it was the first public historically black college in the state. His father, Richard Robert Wright, was founding president in 1891 and served for 30 years. Excuse me. Wright began attending the Divinity School at the University of Chicago in, 19, in 1898, where he found mentor, mentors in William Rainey Harper and Shaler Matthews. And then in 1903, Wright studied in Berlin, Germany, in part inspired by the academic path of W.E.B. Du Bois. Wright studied in Berlin for a term, then went to the University of Leipzig, where he wrote his thesis, the historically, uh, excuse me, the historicity of the Acts of the Apostles. 
He submitted his thesis to the University of Chicago, who offered him an AM and a fellowship in New Testament theology and, and doctrine. So plenty of people, African-Americans at the time period, they went to school to study theology and they wanted to become the pastors. And then there were those who went to school to get involved in nursing and becoming doctors and agriculture. So that was the most biggest things during the time period for African-Americans. And it was also very prevalent for many of them to hold multiple degrees. So many of them had multiple degrees. And in this case, um, he had degrees as a social worker, as a sociologist, and a minister. And those were the stats that you had as black people at that time. Now, today time, most folks don't even want to hold too many degrees, let alone they only want to hold one degree. But going down, it says, influenced by Du Bois, Wright had become interested in the new field of sociology and moved to Philadelphia to work on it. In 1911, Wright became the first African-American to earn a doctorate in sociology from an organized graduate school. Okay, He wrote his dissertation on history of the Pennsylvania Negro under the supervision of Professor Carl Kesley. Or Carl Kesley. He was one of the first African-Americans to earn a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Wright was preceded by a least one another one another African American at Penn, Pazavia or Connell, who earned a PhD in 1898 in Semitic studies for a dissertation on notion of the clean and unclean in the Hebrew Bible. During his time in the doctoral program at Penn, Wright overlapped with the suffrage Alice Paul, and they shared the same advisor in Carl Kelsley. All right. So education was one of the building blocks that defined right early life. Early in life, he studied under his father, who was a strong role model. Georgia State College was the first college he attended where his father was a president. Georgia State College was a technical college that offered few classical courses. After Wright graduated from Georgia State College in 1898, he enrolled in the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. The university had a significant influences on his life. Here he was introduced to biblical studies and he followed his own path into ministry. Soon after he received his Bachelor's of Divinity degree in 1901 and Master's in Biblical Language in 1904, he gained interest in the new field of sociology. Right then goes into his career. So from 1909 to 1936, uh, again, he served as the elder for Christian Recorder, the oldest existing periodical published by African Americans in the United States, whose existing dated before the Civil War. Based in Philadelphia since 1852, it was a primary literary voice for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The first black independent denomination founded in the United States. It also was a major source of news and information about the black community across several regions. As editor, Wright focused on social welfare, becoming a leading advocate on migrants' rights during the great migration of African Americans to the north from the rural south. During his editorship, Wright was also deeply involved in banking. He and his father had founded the Citizen and Southern Bank building in Philadelphia. Wright advocated for African-American-owned banks that serve not only as financial institutions, but as sim symbols of independent and self-reliance for Blacks. In 1928, Wright returned to the ministry as the pastor of the Ward AME Church in Philadelphia. In 1932, Wright moved from Philadelphia to Wilberforce, Ohio, to serve as ninth president of Wilberforce University. Founded during the Civil War, this was the first college to be owned and operated by African Americans. He served for a total of five years, from 1932 to 1936, and from 1941 to 1942. 
All right, so these are the publications, Self-Help in Negro Education, Shani, Pennsylvania, Committee of 12 for the Advancement of the Interests of the Negro Race, circa 1909. The Negro in Pennsylvania, a study in economic history, Philadelphia AME book concern, 1912, 87 years behind the, excuse me, 87 years behind the Black Curtain, an autobiography, Philadelphia rare book that was, that came out in 1965. And then going down, it says personal life. So he was the son of Elizabeth Leah Wright. Um, of course, he was the son of Richard R. Wright. His father was also a politician, civil rights advocate, and later as a banking entrepreneur. So Wright was called by religion from an early age. As a child, he used to play church and preach to other neighborhood children. At 13, Wright became a Sunday school teacher at his church. He later decided to join the ministry. Wright was also inclined toward social justice at a young age. His father encouraged his children to have black role models like W.E.B. Du Bois and to pursue careers that would help others. So in regard to his decision to join the ministry, Wright said, I was much inclined towards law to devote my life to getting my people's legal right, which were being increasingly denied. Still, back of my mind was that one desire to preach. I had never seen but one colored lawyer. He married Charlotte Coleman, daughter of Wright family friends, Dr. William H. Coleman and his wife. Dr. Coleman was the first black president of Clark Atlanta University. After several years of courting in a long friendship, Wright proposed to Charlotte after a game of tennis. The two were married for 49 years until her death in 1959. They had four children together, Ruth, Richard III, Alberta Lavina, and Grace Lydia Wright. Wright was an avid reader and sportsman, particularly fond of swimming, baseball, and tennis. His disdain, dancing, drinking, and card playing. He joined the Democratic Party in 1930s and was a public supporter of President John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. All right. So, as you can see, he carried on his father's legacy, uh, valuing the importance of education, but he was also focused on ministry because he wanted to be able to do missionary works in the African-American community. But again, you know, it's funny that so many people talk down on black Christians, which I understand that many people have their own views and perception about Christianity or any other Abrahamic religion, which they would, which they are entitled to. You have the right to have your views and some of those things are very logical and they have a very valid argument but at the same time many of our people who were openly candid about their Africanness and that was proud are those who practiced the Abrahamic religion they created the gateway to make people comfortable and being what they are today. So they have created that gateway for people to be comfortable of being a Pan-Africanist, people being comfortable to study other African concept, right? To be able to get involved in black nationalism. So a lot of these folks, they were into religion. They were into the concept of God. So before you even dismiss our people who practiced Christianity and Abrahamic religion. Remember, it was those people that created a gateway for you. Let's not forget that. Those people opened up doors. They put up a fight. Even they went against their own people who was now into the black liberation and the black nationalism. They were more into integration, multiculturalism. Right, they all bumped heads with each other just so these group of black folks who want to practice black nationalism 
to, they can have an opportunity. They can be very comfortable and they don't have to worry about being shut out or being outcast or seeking permission to be proud of their heritage. So let's not forget that these people have put up a fight for that. Let's not forget that. So it was those in the Abrahamic religion. I don't know many atheists, black atheists at that, that really did these things. They really went above and beyond to put up a fight to bring about black liberation. I don't know many of them. And if they are, maybe some of those people were those who joined the Marxism that study into the whole anarchy movement, etc., because a lot of, because those blacks who was into the Marxism, socialism, they became atheists. So we want to talk about those people. Yeah, they did some things. They did great things. But overall, in general, when it came to black people, when it came to black liberation, it was mostly done by those that was in the Abrahamic religion. And we cannot argue against that. So they create those pathways. They create those opportunities. They open up those doors. So how can we forget about that? How can we just turn a blind eye on that? It's something to think about. All right. So that's that information on Richard R. Wright. Now, I want to get to the next one. This one had caught me by surprise. I never heard the name. I never heard nobody ever mention the name that I know. So I happened to browse through the internet and I seen the name of this college was called Guadalupe College or Guadalupe College, however it's pronounced. And I said, well, let me look into it. Um, interesting. In history, it was founded in Texas, in Sagoon, Texas, or excuse me, Sagi, Texas. It was in Sagin, Texas, and of course, it didn't last very long. Like many HBCUs that was around during that time, they didn't last pretty long either. But, however, the name still carried on the legacy and the information is still available. So I do have some re read material regards to Guadalupe College. Okay, and I want to show this flyer that I saw. It says, Guadalupe College needs your help. Okay. So it's some type of flyer. I uh, guess what this flyer represent is uh, they want to raise some type of funding for the college. It was during, it was back in a time period. So they were trying to raise funding. And to this day, a lot of HBCUs having a hard time uh, gaining funds to keep the maintenance of the building, to make sure the faculty are paid. But you can thank Joe Biden on that one and his administration for telling these uh, institution they would cut $45 billion down to $2 billion, which that's not enough money for all of them. That's not enough money for them. But that's Joe Biden and that's his policy. That's just the way he operates. <laughs> yeah, that's how he operates, but this is what we voted for. Well, I didn't vote, but this is what our people voted for. This is what our people gravitated towards. They gravitated towards Biden because he's a Democrat and he can talk a good game. And our people didn't think twice about it. But the same thing that we said about Trump is the same thing that you see with Biden. Well, let's go ahead and continue. Okay, let me go ahead and get through this. Okay, so.
Now, Guadalupe College was founded as a junior college. Then it became a senior college. Okay. The final the founder was William B. Ball. Let's see if I can find out who William B. Ball is. Let's see, William B. Ball. Hold on, let me, I'm pulling up the information right now. Let me see. I think this is the information here. I'm not sure. I think so, because I'm on Texas State Historical Association website. So I think, I believe this is the information. Let me see. That's the picture of him over here to the left. And let's see who was William B. Ball. Uh, he was born 1839. Yeah, he was born 1839. He died 1923. So William B. Ball, a black soldier, school official, and minister, was born in Danville, Kentucky on February the 5th, 1839. He grew up at his parents' farm and farm and then moved to Zena, Z Zenina, Ohio, where he worked his way through Oberlin College. He enlisted in the Union Army in 1860 and served in the cavalry of the 99th division 149th regiment he received an honorable discharge in 1868 and moved to Texas in 1869 he organized a military company at San Antonio obtained a commission as a captain and served for a time on the frontier Ball moved to Seguin in 1871 and on March 21st 1872 he married Rachel Carwright the couple had 10 children in 1871 with the help of Reverend Leonard Isley. Ball organized the first school for blacks in Guadalupe County. So he is the founder. So, yeah, he organized the first school for blacks in Guadalupe County. The Abraham Lincoln School in Seguin. He was its principal for many years in 1884. I'm just trying to see it correlates. Okay, in 1884, he and an associate. Hold on. Try to highlight this. So in 1884, he and an associate, a black Baptist, founded Negro Baptist College at the site of the present Joe F. Sager Middle School in Seguin. In 1887, it was reorganized as Guadalupe Color College. Okay. So Ball later obtained the help of philanthropist George W. Brackenridge, who, who funded the expansion of the college physical plant in 1904 and purchased a new site for the institution in 1905. Ball served as the president of the college for eight years. In 1920, after 30 years of service as pastor of the Second Baptist Church at Seguin, he resigned from his position. He died on January 26, 1923 at Seguin. In 1925, Lincoln High School was renamed Ball High School, and on J June 19, 1939, a swimming pool in an auditorium gymnasium for the school was dedicated and named in his honor. The building was used for an elementary school in the 1980s, but still carried Ball's name. A major street in Seguin is also named W.B. Ball. 
All right, so this is the correct information. All right, so go back or recap. He opened up the first school in Guadalupe County, which was Abraham Lincoln School, right? And he was the principal for many years. Then also in 1884, him and the Associate Baptist, Black Baptist, they opened up the Negro Baptist College because that's what it was called in the beginning. It was called the Negro Baptist College. Then it was reorganized as Guadalupe Color College. All right. So you'll come to find out that, uh, yeah, there were some HBCUs that were founded by Europeans to give schools to African American during the uh, laws that was presented at the time in the grants that they were, were receiving. But then you were also, and those who did found school for African Americans, they were abolitionists. Okay. But then there are uh, those blacks who opened up schools, right? And they were missionaries, they were Baptists, they were ministers, they were members of churches that they opened up the facility to be able to teach biblical things and teach them about survival and all that other stuff. All right. So these are one of the fewest schools that was open and operated and owned by African Americans. Okay. Um, I made sure that I would do more topics on HBCUs, the ones that are currently here and the ones that are no longer in function. So that's my primary goal is to get through all of them because it's important that we see what entrepreneur looks like and what our people have done and how they came up into the struggle of creating these educational facility in the community and these uh, opportunity that was given that was available to our folks. Since we have this idea collectively that our people didn't do anything and they just they just wasn't doing that and they wasn't active, which that was not true. And that's where people tend to not, that's when people tend to not uh, do the necessary reading. That's, that's, that's how you can tell that they don't get involved in a lot of reading material. All right, but let's go down to Guadalupe College. So again, it was a private Baptist college for African-American in Seguin, Texas, okay? Um, it was established in 1884 and officially opened in 1887. And it was founded chiefly due to the efforts of William B. Ball, who later became his president. David Abner Jr. was president of of Guadalupe College from 1891 to 1906, a 15-year tenor during the college flourish and gained statewide recognition at its height during his administration. The college had an enrollment of approximately 500 students. Guadalupe College offered a traditional liberal art program based on classical courses as well as an academy and grammar school, but comparatively little agricultural or trades-based education. It was recognized as a junior college by the Texas Department of Education in 1926 and briefly attained senior college status. From 1929 to 1931, before being adversely affected by the Great Depression. Guadalupe's college main building was destroyed by a fire in 1936 and the college became defunct in 1937 at a fundraising drive was canceled. All right. So the little flyer that I had up basically was to try to raise money up for the school because the school was destroyed by fire. And so they could not raise enough money. So they went on ahead and ended up canceling the fund and they also closed the school for good. And it says numerous later attempts to reestablish the college were, were unsuccessful. Now, let's go down here to the history. So Guadalupe College. Um, 
All right, so it says the association was led chiefly by William B. Ball, an African-American Civil War veteran, minister and academic from Ohio, and Reverend Leonard Isley, a white preacher. Ball, the founder of the college, was a member of both the 24th Inf Infantry Regiment and 28th Infantry Regiment of the United States so Army, in which he served for three years during the American Indian Wars. In 1884, the Guadalupe Baptist Association purchased a large plot of land for $6,500, which was the site of many schools previously and is currently home of Joe F. Sagar Middle School. In 1887, Guadalupe College's first official session was open with J.H. Garnett serving as president. Enrollment for the first 12 years averaged over 200 students annually. On March 28, 1888, the state of Texas granted a charter to the college. Its goal was to provide the African-American community with an education compar comparable to white institutions of the day. This curriculum at Guadalupe College consists of four years of classical courses, which led to a Bachelor of Arts degree through the college department. Additionally, students could receive training and certification through five other departments, industrial, musical, preparatory, primary, and theological. Guadalupe College early fund came from grassroots effort of the African-American community, principally donated through their churches. Additionally, philanthropist George W. Brackenridge donated considerably to the college, including giving its fund for a new chapel auditorium in a value, valuable 216-acre tract on the Guadalupe River of West uh, Seguin. Okay, so that's David Abner, Jr., All right, so Garnett was succeeded by David Abner Jr. in 1891, marking the beginning of Abner's 15-year tenure, during which the college flourished and gained statewide recognition. During this time, attendance ranged from 300 to 500 students annually. Abner was the first African-American to graduate from a Texas institution of higher learning. Before becoming president of Guadalupe College, he was a professor at the Baptist Home Missionary Society of New York and was a delegate for Louisville, Kentucky's National Convention of Black Men. Due to his large success with the college, Abner received many offers from Northern Institution. These positions reportedly offered much higher status and pay, but Abner declined them all and is, quote, saying, I am a Southern man conducting a school for the color use of the South and expected to remain right where I am. And he was well devoted. He was well devoted. He said, nah, I'm not going to give this up. Okay. So again, this is the picture of William B. Ball. Okay, that's William B. Ball. In 1906, Abner resigned under pressure from the college trustees. His successor, as President William B. Ball entered a challenging period at Guadalupe College defined by lawsuits, financial crisis, declining enrollment, and loss of state endorsement. He served as president until 1913. By 1917, Ball had been named President Emeritus of the college with a contemporary issue of the Apostle Herald, observing he was the only Negro in the world holding such title. As President Emeritus, Ball earned a monthly salary of $60 until his death in 1923. In 1914, George Brackenridge purchased the college and saved it from financial ruin. He and the college booster moved it to farmland on the Guadalupe River in 1914, where two new brick buildings were built for the college, a four-story combined classroom and women's dormitory building and a three-story men's dormitory in November 1914, William Henry Moses of Tennessee became the college news president. Guadalupe College's traditional liberal arts program was retained alongside at an academy and grammar school with comparatively little agricultural trade-based education. 
So during this period, college students were required to provide evidence of good moral character, attend Sunday school and weekly prayer meetings, and work for the college on a daily basis. So in 1916, Marlin native Jesse Washington was named president. During his tenure, he created a Bachelor of Arts in science degree and organized the college curriculum into nine divisions. In 1921, Dallas Express article called Guadalupe College the leading educational institution for Negroes in this session of the state. That year, former, pre, excuse me, former Prairie View AML College professor Charles H. Griggs succeeded Washington as Guadalupe College professor. I mean, excuse me, Guadalupe College president in 1926. The Texas Department of Education recognized Guadalupe College as a standard junior college and accepted its teacher education credits, which bolstered its enrollment. In 1927, Florida native FGS Everett was named president of Guadalupe College. During his tenure, a two story president's house was built. On campus. In May 1929, Guadalupe was officially recognized as a senior college. By the early 1930s, enrollment in the college was averaging about 60 students annually, with another 125 or so in the academy division. Guadalupe College was adversely affected by the Great Depression and reverted, reverted to its previous status as a junior college in 1931. In 1930, J.R. Lockett became the president, the college next president. On February 9th, 1936, the main campus building was destroyed in a fire. A fundraising was canceled in 1937 and the college ceased operation. So while General Baptist Convention did build a new building and held classes for both ministers and lay people on the site of the 1940s, a fully accredited college was never reestablished after the fire. Furthermore, while the Texas Secretary of State issued a new charter in 1971 to the College of the Guadalupe Baptist Association, and alumni succeeded in refurbishing a wooden chapel for group meetings. No regularly scheduled classes were ever held. All right, so you got to look at the legacy. So alumnus Henry F. Wilson coordinated a union of about 200 former students and their families on July 26, 1979. The event was held in Seguin, Guadalupe County Coliseum and included a tour of the campus, signing of college songs, recognition of attendees, and speeches covering the history, goals, and status of the college. The oldest former student in attendance was Mozzarella Allen, 91, who graduated from Guadalupe College sometime around 1900. Estella P. Burns, the oldest living former Guadalupe College teacher, was also in attendance. Participant on the tour visited the college's former auditorium and unfinished building on which construction was started after the fire. And Former college buildings that were converted into a religious education school, the union, the reunion became an annual event that continued drawing former students, teachers, and their families. The last confirmed reunion was held in 1986 and drew about 35 former students. By 1985, the only remaining building on the former campus was a chapel, but Alumni endeavor to start a trade school on the property and raise cattle. They made progress towards this goal when in 1986 they raised enough money to run a waterline onto the land. In 1985, reunion, Henry F. Wilson, who by this time was the president of the Guadalupe College Ex Student Association, said, We want to leave a landmark for our people and provide models for our race to grow, to follow. So by 1995, the Guadalupe Baptist District Association College Inc. had joined in the reconstruction efforts with the goal of moving Guadalupe Baptist Seminary from San Antonio to the former Guadalupe College campus in Seguin by 1997. In 1997, the school representative made attempts to sell a portion of the land to generate funds for the project. All right, so that is a history, and here's the noble alumni 
Okay. All right, so let's look at some information about David Abner Jr. All right. Um, so real quick. So who was he? Let's just look at him for yeah, let's just look at the information real fast. So David Abner Jr. was born on November the 25th. And today is the 25th, I believe, right? Yeah, today is the 25th, so that's interesting. So David Abner Jr. was born on November the 25th, 1860, and he died on July the 21st, 1928. He was an American educator. He was the first president of the Guadalupe College and then of Caro College, all right? So he was born in Upshore County, Texas, the son of David Abner and Lu Louisa Abner. The, his family was enslaved until emancipation, but his father would become a delegate to the state constitutional convention and state legislature. And in 1870, they moved to Marshall, Texas, where Abner attended Willie University. He then enrolled in Strait University in New Orleans. In 1877, he enrolled at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. In 1881, he enrolled at Bishop College, where he graduated in 1884, becoming the first African-American to graduate from a Texas School of Higher Education. He then became a professor at the school. He was a delegate to the National Convention of the Colored Men, part of the Color Convention Movement in September 1883. In 1884, he became the corresponding secretary of the Baptist State Convention of Texas. He also edited the convention papers known as the Baptist Journal and later as the Baptist Plight. All right. So he was a college president. So again, in 1884, Guadalupe College was found primarily through the effort of William B. Ball. That's redundant. So I don't need to read that again. Um, so. Abner was made the first president of the school, a position he served until 1905 when he was forcibly removed due to opposition within the Baptist church leadership. The denomination opened a new third convention in the state and created a new college, Conroe College. Thereupon, in 1906, Abner was elected the first president of Conroe College. So his personal life, he was married to Ella M. Willer, with whom he had two children. He died on August 21st. 1928 in Houston, Texas. So right here, you can see down here at the very bottom of the page, you can look at the reference and you can look at the external link. All right. So that's it. That's all for today. I hope you guys have a wonderful day or this wonderful Thanksgiving or whatever you want to call it. Enjoy yourself, enjoy your family, enjoy some good meal and be safe. Chill on your day off. Don't get caught up in no nonsense. And also be safe because we still out here in this pandemic. But too bad a lot of places is closed. So you can't really go anywhere. So you ain't got no show but to really stay your behind the house. I'm just saying. But anyhow, with that being said, this your girl Tiffany. I'm going to go ahead and log off and I'm going to get my day started. And there are those of us that got to go to work. And I am one of those people that have to work on this particular day. It sucks, but hey, it is what it is. I mean, I got responsibility. I got to do things. I got shit to take care of. But anyhow, I will check in with you guys later. So be safe. And until next time, peace and power elevation be to all of you. And thank you for tuning in. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>